So, who would have thought a couple of years ago that we'd all have fuel poverty in the common parlance? It was on the news last night, it was mentioned in Parliament yesterday, and you know, people are, are generally speaking about it, but, but what is fuel poverty? Well, the traditional definition was um, invented by Dr. Brenda Borgman in, uh, in the 1980s, and that was very simple. If you spent more than 10% of your disposable income on uh, heating your house, you were deemed to be in fuel poverty. Now, some people didn't, weren't able to spend 10%, they, they chose to eat rather than heat, but that is the very basic definition. And that's still used today, even on the news yesterday, even though there is a new definition that the government uh, commissioned a report by uh, Professor John Hills there. And um, it's more linked to low income, high costs of properties and the, uh, the price of fuel as well. But um, I'll, I'll tend to dip in between the two definitions because the older definition is is uh, really useful and it's easy to understand. Um, now, believe it or not, fuel is still relatively cheap in the UK compared to the rest of Europe. We're sort of middling. We're, we're not the most expensive. We're not the cheapest. But the trend is fuel prices are going upwards and you will expect them to go upwards forever more now. Irrespective of taking £50 off, off the bill, that's a spit in the ocean. Um, the average price rises that we work on when we do our calculations are between 6 and 9%. And you can see that most of the rises that, that came uh, this, this winter before the announcement yesterday were in, in that range. Uh, three sorts of built forms of, of houses there, um, from Victorian to, through to very modern houses. Uh, what I could say is the average fuel bill across all the uh, sort of building stock is about £1,300 uh, per annum. So if you look at that old fuel poverty definition, that need, means that you need about £13,000 a year to live on uh, to spend 10% of, of your income on, on fuel. Now if you look at those anticipated price rises, 6 to, to 9%, that means by about 2020 you're looking at uh, an average bill each year of £2,000. And by uh, 2030 it's £3,300. So again, using the old definition, you can see there that you're going to need £20,000 in 2020, £33,000 in uh, 2030, um, not to be uh, in fuel poverty. And that's at the lowest rise, is the 6%. Um, the problem is, is that our annual incomes aren't keeping pace with that, and people on fixed incomes definitely aren't keeping pace with that either. So there's two um, areas that, that cause fuel poverty, personal circumstances and technical. So sort of personal circumstances are very much under occupancy of the house. Uh, you'll have you'll get people that may be asset rich uh, but cash poor. You could get a family home that uh, over the years has now dwindled down to one single person living there, usually the, the female, uh, the mother. Yeah. Uh, they might choose to self-disconnect because they can't afford the bills. And they'll, they'll live in one room and say so they'll choose to eat rather than heat. Um, susceptibility is not just the old, it can be young, it can be the disabled, the infirm. And 73% of households in this country do contain what's called a vulnerable person, so someone who's in, in that group. Um, fuel poverty in a lot of cases is general poverty, people just don't have the money. They're also unaware of what grants there, uh, there are available out there, what discounts and offers are available. For example, the, the ECO, the energy company obligation, that probably none of you had heard of and, <laughs> until yesterday, um, that's been around in, in several forms for nine and 20 years now. And also, the energy companies, I, I know that um, we're denigrating them all the time now, but they do have a corporate social responsibility side to them. And there is an organisation called Charis that basically takes money that's developed into a fund from utility companies, not just energy companies, water companies as well. And they can spend that money on, on helping people get out of, out of debt in their home, not just fuel debt, it can be any sort of debt. I'll give you a website for that later if you're interested. So are people on the, on the best tariff for them? The government's done a lot of work um, over the last couple of years and they've made Ofgem um, re, uh, get the energy companies to reduce their tariffs. And in fact, in a few, few years' time, there'll only be one or two tariffs that we, we can choose from to, to use because they are complicated. Not as complicated as mobile phone tariffs, but they're, they're getting that way. And also, in, in some of the worst houses, uh, people are on prepayment meters, and these are the most expensive form of paying for their energy. Um, 
We've gone on a lot today about the private rental sector, but one th area to recognise is owner occupiers that you know, you get a lot of people where they're asset rich and, and cash poor, all their money is in their house, they don't have the money to live on. Um, issue with, with uh, tenant properties is that uh, tenants may not be able to improve their homes without their landlord's consent, even if, if they do get the consent, and it's a split responsibility because the landlord often has been unwilling to invest or is not aware of the grants that are around um, because the tenant pays the bills, the reduced bills if they improve the property and gets the, the benefit from uh, the, the funding that's been put in. Right, do you recognise this property? Right, it's not do you ask a millionaire, so I'm going to tell you what it is, it's Buckingham Palace because believe it or not the Queen is nearly in fuel poverty under that 10% definition. Um, but, you know, she can afford to pay the bills through, through the civil list. Um, poorer households are more likely to live in poorly insulated homes and so they're less likely to be able to improve their homes in the efficiency. Wealthier households may be more profligate, as you can see there. This thermal image shows where the heat is escaping, so the light coloured areas, the, the red areas, are where heat is escaping from that property. And so, you know, most people who, who can afford to will invest in uh, money to insulate the house, a better heating system, perhaps even renewables. Obviously this is a listed <coughs> building so it's a bit difficult on Buckingham Palace to do some of those things. So technical factors with regard to uh, causing of fuel poverty. Now historically we've built houses that are strong. Um, we must build them cheap, we must build them quickly. Uh, people are more interested in the capital cost of their home rather than the running costs. But uh, even in today's age, fuel energy efficiency on a property is probably 19th out of 20th on someone's list when they go to look for a house. But it is becoming more important because of this issue about uh, the rising prices. Um, even in um, poorly insulated houses, um, a modern heating system can make a difference with, with good heating controls. Um, we're, we're expecting more comfort nowadays, which is, is another issue. Um, the average uh, winter temperature inside a house in the 1970s in a centrally heated house was about 14 degrees. Uh, and nowadays it's 17 degrees, so we're expecting a bit more comfort. Uh, those same um, time gaps without central heating was about 11 degrees in the 1970s and about 15 degrees um, uh, now without central heating. So how would you um, spot fuel poverty? Well, some of the signs, as I said earlier, it, it's often in a lot of cases it, it is poverty. It's people living alone. It's people who aren't able to maintain the house. So you can sometimes spot what you'd expect to be a typical person in fuel poverty from looking at the outside of the house. The, the garden might be run down. Uh, the, the paint might be peeling from the windows. There might be some general disrepair. Um, single glazing in a lot of cases, or blown double glazing if, it, if it's an older one. You might notice that the school kids uh, stay home often because there's a lot of absenteeism from school because they're real. Dampness is, is a big issue and we'll come on to, to more about that later. So it's a national uh, stock distribution by age of, of the, the properties in the country and what you can see there is um, not many houses have been built since the 1990s. Uh, the majority of our housing stock has been built before then and um, one of the issues is that about 75% of the houses that are built today will still be around in 2050. That's the rate at which we demolish and get rid of our older houses. And these are the ones that are causing the most problems. These are the ones that we have to try and tackle. There have been significant improvements to new built properties from the 1990s, not as quick as some of us would like, and um, there is a, a big lobby from the building industry to try and uh, slow that down so that uh, they can get the capacity to build uh, um, more energy efficient houses in the future. The issue is we're still 30 years behind Scandinavia and other parts of Europe that are on the same sort of latitude as us and get the same climatic conditions. Now it is possible to build houses and to retrofit houses to a very high energy efficiency standard um, I've mentioned uh, passive house, that, that is really the, the Rolls Royce of energy standards with regard to houses. These are houses that are super insulated, very airtight, ventilated right, you can still breathe in them. Um, no thermal bridges, 
Um, you might have triple glazing, but they've definitely got to improved glazing. You don't have to go to that extent in this country, but uh, there are ways to improve your, your house to, to a greater extent to, to get close to that. Uh, the thermal image there, that is a passive house in the middle there in Hereford, and it shows the difference, the same sort of house either side, what, what can be done. So these new breed of energy efficient houses that, that are um, becoming more and more prevalent, um, you don't need a conventional heating system to run them. Um, often um, you don't need a heating system at all. They run by the heat, the excess heat that comes from lights and appliances. They, they uh, get extra from solar gain that comes through the window. They get heat from people's bodies themselves. You just sitting here in a sedentary position, you're giving off 60 watts of heat. So if you count up the number of people that, that are in here, that's quite a few watts there. And the thing is, these houses, when you do build them like that, when you retrofit them, getting up to this standard, they protect the, the occupants from these energy price rises. If you're only paying 25% of that £1,300 as your fuel bill, it, it doesn't matter if it goes up 6%, you can still afford to pay that. So this is how Austrian people explain the, the running cost message to, to uh, tenants. And this particular um, housing uh, complex here was going to be renovated, yes to a passive house standard, but they do renovate to, to slightly lower standards here as well. Now the, the pyramid of all barrels on the left is what a typical person in Austria would, would use in, in, their, in their house, or that block would use in their house, should I say. And on the right, that's what it would be after the house was, was or the complex was renovated. Yes, it would cost the tenants a little bit more in their rent, but they would more than make up for that in the savings in their energy bill. And in this particular case, there was a 90% 90 re 90 reduction in their heating costs. I mentioned debtless earlier, and this obviously is a, is a big issue in poorly maintained houses, isn't it? There's one particular form of debtless condensation that I'll go into um, in more detail in the next slide, but these are four typical sources of dampness that, that we will see in, in a lot of houses. Get the top left hand um, slide there is writing damp. Now you'll see this on the ground floor, not the first floor, so it's where outside there's a bridge that might bridge the damper of course, it might not even have a damper of course, um, and often what you'll see there is, is a tide level about one metre up on, on the wall where water from the outside is going through the external wall into the inside. Uh, the rain penetration, which is the bottom left hand corner there, is where you might have poorly pointed brickwork, uh, and this is more often in a case where the house is in exposed conditions on the coast uh, on, a, on, a high, uh, on a high level. The top right there is faulty rainwater disposal, which also could add to the one on the bottom left. So if you've got a leaking gutter, a leaking downpipe, a broken downpipe, it could get uh, through the wall and get into the inside. And the last one there is a plumbing defect, so um, the, the property above, if it's a flat, uh, could be a leaking sink, kitchen, toilet, bath, something like that. But with regard to fuel poverty and damaged homes, the major cause of, of dampness in homes is condensation. Now, uh, I think all of us experience condensation in one form or another, and the best analogy I can give is after you've had a bath or a shower, the minute you um, let the water run out of the bath or you stop the shower, you can feel a difference in temperature. And, and what happens is that when air is, is warm, it can hold more moisture. So the minute that you do um, uh, stop adding uh, to the heat in the bath or, or the shower, that water that's in the air starts to condense out on the nearest colder surface. So that could be a wall, if it's a north facing wall as we've got here, more likely to be a window, a mirror, um, a cold bridge, so a lintel above a window perhaps, something like that. And this is where there's uh, a lack of insulation uh, to the outside of the property. The surface temperature of, of that uh, part of the fabric is colder and so that's where the, uh, the water that, that comes out of the air will condense. So if you get nothing else uh, other than today for your own personal use as, as well as in your professional use, it's this balance between these three bits of this triangle. You've got to have adequate heating, insulation and, and ventilation. If one of those is out of sync, you're likely to get condensation in one form or another. Obviously, 
I'm not saying to you make your houses completely airtight. You know, we, we've got to breathe. But, and ventilation is important because you get rid of normal household smells from fumes and, and other activities. But condensation, I'm not saying it's easy. It is the, the most common form of this, and it's also the most the hardest one to solve. Well, the most expensive one to solve in some cases because you've, you've either got to uh, in, pay money to increase the insulation, pay money to spend more on fuel, or to install some sort of mechanical ventilation. So these are typical condensation conditions in, in a typical property, and you can see there that uh, where, where you'll get conden condensation occurring. So underneath the window uh, in, in the sill there, perhaps at a bridge between the floor and the wall. Um, I've been into properties where it's been cold and damp the minute you walk in. You open up your wardrobe and you see a layer of mould on the leather clothes and the shoes that are in there because it's that bad. Now, I'm not saying that an energy efficient retrofit is easy. It's, it's not. Um, besides the cost, you may have other issues with regard to planning. If you live in a house that's built um, at the turn of the last century, it's going to have solid walls. There's not a lot you can do with those properties other than insulate them inside or outside. And if you insulate them outside, there could be issues with regard to planning, the fact they might not fit in with the rest of the property in the street. But planning authorities are looking very favourably on, on these now. If you're going to insulate internally, you're going to have space issues because um, when you insulate internally, you put a series of battens up on the inside of the wall, um, um, make it uh, weatherproof as well, uh, but also then infill that with the insulation material. So that's going to eat into the, uh, the volume of the room. And there's obviously space requirements for, for ventilation if you put in mechanical ventilation with heat recovery or even a simple extract fan in some cases. But if you do live in a well insulated uh, heat and vent ventilated property, um, it's amazing that, uh, how little heat you have to put into that property. And there are no drafts in, in properties that, that are airtight. Uh, the, the main problem with drafts is that it's where you get a temp temperature differential of 4 degrees C between your head and your foot. That's when people uh, fill these drafts. Um, and so with modern properties, well insulated, well, uh, these things do disappear. So you get improved thermal comfort. You reduce the risk of the surface condensation and mold growth by controlling the moisture that's in the air. <coughs> so it does improve the comfort and the well-being of the person. <coughs> and I've got a triple glazed window uh, on the top one there, but it doesn't have to be short glazed. You can get some very good double glazed windows. So even with a, a really low temperature outside, you can get a, a nice surface temperature inside. You don't get the drafts. It's a constant temperature throughout the building. <coughs> Yes, people's behaviour does add to, to um, condensation in their property as well. Um, when you sleep in your bed overnight, you're, you're breathing out moisture as a function of, of respiring, and the figure we've got here is half a litre, and often when you wake up in the morning, particularly on a day like today, you'll see that on your windows. Um, people being active, not sure in the bedroom, but elsewhere in the building, or, or doing some exercise, you give off moisture when you perspire. When you cook, you, you give moisture, particularly if you cook by gas. Uh, I've already mentioned bathing and drying clothes. And the bottom right hand corner there, we've got one of these ubiquitous uh, colour gas heaters. <coughs> now, for every litre of gas you burn there, you're going to give off a litre of moisture. So you can imagine, if you're not getting rid of that moisture, <coughs> excuse me, it's going to condense inside the property. And the other issue is that those um, those heaters, they battle for the oxygen in the room as well, because you need that for the complete combustion. So, Torben has already mentioned this. Um, part of the um, issue today is focusing on the private rented sector. And you get tenants and their representatives saying to the landlord, please improve our property. You've got the landlords and the representatives saying, I don't need to, it's your lifestyle that's causing the problem. The fact is, it could be a combination of, of, of both these. Now I've mentioned a bit of legislation down the bottom there. Now some of you may be familiar <coughs> with what's, uh, what this is. In fact, it's 2008, sorry, not 2011. But um, from 2018, um, any rental property in the commercial sector or in the domestic sector will have to have a minimum energy efficiency rating. Now, most of you m may uh, uh, have come across these when you're buying or selling a house. So it's this 
Arco that you see now. You see them on white goods when you buy 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 uh, freezers or freezers. It's an HG rating. And all houses, when they're bought, sold, or rented, have to have a, a one of these energy performance certificates for their property. And um, from 2018, the minimum energy standard is going to be an E, which isn't very good, but you'd be surprised at the number of F and G rated uh, properties there are still out there. And these will no longer be able to be rented after 2018. So for landlords, uh, particularly with old housing stock, they've got a decision to make. Now from 2016, the tenants of these properties can ask their landlord to do reasonable things to the house to improve the energy efficiency. Um, I know there's a story that if, if tenants start asking questions, that's probably the sign that they're going to be evicted or you know, after their tenancy ends, the landlord will ask them to leave. Um, but so from 2016, the poor thermal conditions when the house isn't going to be an excuse anymore. I don't know if you're going to feel sorry for landlords saying they've got to spend their money here, but um, the way the government think that the landlords are, uh, are going to get out of this issue is they've got to make use of these energy company obligation funds that are around. So um, the green levies that you've heard a lot about recently, we all pay a little bit into that at the moment in our, in our annual fuel bills. And the energy companies use this money in order to make houses more energy efficient. Um, yes, that may be coming out of the fuel bills into general taxation, which is probably a good thing because that means that the fuel poor who are paying the fuel bills aren't paying uh, that part of the, uh, part of the levy. Um, but the government's expecting landlords to make use of these offers that are around, and if they can't do that, to make use of the other government initiative that's around, it's called the Green Deal. Now, the Green Deal is a way that there is no upfront cost to improving the conditions in your property uh, with regard to energy efficiency, um, but you get a loan that can be over 25 years, and this loan is paid back through your electricity bill. So what this means for landlords, in fact, is that they don't end up paying for the improvements, it's their tenants that pay for the improvements through their electricity bill. So it's a simple checklist. I'm not going to read these out here. Um, I'll just say points two and five, uh, so a low level of, of background heat and try to heat every part of the home. That's if your house has got a reasonable level of, of insulation. If you live in an older property, it's like a sieve, so you're pumping heat in and it's just escaping really easily. Um, we've developed this checklist into something for landlords to use through Chelmsford uh, City Council. So there is a business case for, for landlords uh, to invest in energy efficiency. Besides making their tenants happier and hopefully having a content tenant and, and uh, rental income coming in on a regular basis, it does add value to, to, to their asset. And um, an important thing to, to recognise with regard to energy company obligation is that you can use your tenants if they are on benefits to actually uh, be the key to unlocking some of this energy company obligation money. And another issue is that uh, the landlord uh, can get tax relief if they do spend their own money on some of these energy efficiency measures through something called the landlord's uh, energy saving allowance. So that is through HMRC. So some resources, uh, or sources of advice, the Energy Saving Advice Service, uh, there called ESAS, uh, free phone number. Um, they were trained by the Energy Saving Trust and there is a stand for the Energy Saving Trust outside. So please go and see Karen, I'm sure she'll be able to help you or point you in the right direction. And the other one there you might be interested in is this one called Charis, Charis Grants, where uh, energy companies um, and other utilities pay into a fund uh, a charitable fund that's used to help people get out of uh, issues with regard to debt. And there's a telephone number there based in Peterborough. They do cover the whole of the East of England and a um, website as well. So thank you very much and I'll answer your questions a bit later. Thank you.